From the faintly glimmering citrine throne of Sigdir, King Storkhumlir Az Seg, 18th of his name, was contemplating that there seemed to be more friends outside the Southern Hold than within it. Endless petitions from nobles, priests, merchants, the beholden, explorers, builders, warriors, adventurers and mages drove the king to rage on a daily basis. Storkhumlir has kept the hall safe for almost 150 years. A warrior and an administrator, he is not some wet pup, which he reminds his advisors as often as he finds the energy to do so. The only times the king is not raging is when the delegations from Azkasur are announced. For a race so short-lived, the humans of Azkasur seem like the most level-headed creatures in Halan. Besides, they also brew a mean coffee, black as a knoll's behind and spicy as a harpy. Unlike their kin in the north, there was no major diaspora that led to the rise of the surface-dwelling dwarves, and most dwarves still live amongst the holes in the middle serpent's spine. The most populous of the holes is Sekdir. In fact, when one sees a dwarf anywhere in Sarhal, they are often seeing a Sekdiran dwarf. The southern gates are more often open, which cannot be said about the exit which faces the depths of the mountain. Azkasur's existence and independence owes itself to the dwarves of Sekdir, and in exchange they act as guides, loyal trading partners and true friends of the southern dwarves. Sekdir finds itself in an interesting position. The Citrine Hold is sandwiched between their ally Azkasur and the province of Segrod. Beyond the Suran, the hordes of Zoka and the legions of Jadar are locked in conflict and endanger their loyal ally. To the north, the splendid dwarven infrastructure was overrun by tens of thousands of goblins. Perhaps the greatest challenge in expanding back towards the depths of the Dwarovar lies dormant here. Attacking natives in the Serpent Spine is expensive and not worth it usually, but in the case of this one province it might be a justified action. There are two major additions in the Warlords of Halles 1.0 to the Dwarves of Anbenar. One comes from the vanilla game in the form of a better expanded infrastructure mechanic. Infrastructure may be expanded at different development levels for cumulative gains. Most important being construction cost, construction time and development cost reduction, but also granting extra manufacturing slots which is quite amazing. While digging deeper and deeper, expanding infrastructure in the capital hold at the very least must always be top priority. The second major mechanic for remnants such as Sigdir is the remnant stagnation disaster. This fires at the game start and gives an interesting choice on how to approach the early stages of the game. There will be no colonization while the disaster is active and government progress will be slowed down. Three choices are presented, between the internal reclaimants who want to improve the hold, the explorers who want to set out and colonize, and the warriors or Segdiran guard who want to, well, uh, fight. Each of these factions can be funded with manpower, cash and power points via events or directly from the nation's coffers. The three factions compete for funds but are largely coexisting. There is a fourth faction which opposes progress and these are the Beholden. They will be angered by any advancement of the other faction's plans and will occasionally take up arms. When that happens, they can be fought or appeased. Appeasing them can grant free development in the hold, but will essentially erase any progress gained by the other factions. When the plans of one of the progressist factions are complete, then a decision can be taken to awaken the remnant and end the disaster. The decision will offer a major 50-year buff specific to the winning faction. The fun bit is that you may still continue to contribute to the other two. If other factions also get to finish their plans, then they will also contribute with a minor buff in addition to the major one when the disaster is over. For example, if the Reclaimers and the Expansionists both finish their plans and the Reclaimers are chosen as the main faction to lead the Awakening, then a free hold level will be gained from the Reclaimers together with a minor global settler increase bonus from the Expansionists. All of the bonuses are quite strong. The Warrior's main bonus is maybe a bit less impressive, but they usually work very well as an added minor bonus. More details about the disaster can be found in the link to this Reddit post of user Aga underscore Arik. Linked in the description. King Storkhumlir in November 1444 decided to do something about his whole stagnation. Fueled by coffee, he appeased all the estates by granting them crown land in exchange for more political power. 
he declared the supremacy of the religious culture of the Citrine Dwarfs and ordered the priest to teach Hechogrim's treatise on architecture in schools and temples. Nobles were giving estate statutory rights in exchange for a large amount of property within the hold. Plans for expansion into the middle Dwarovar started to be drafted and all necessary equipment and manpower were granted to the expansionist faction. Infrastructure was expanded and in 1450 development of the Grand Southern Hold was accelerated and digging commenced again after centuries of stagnation. All preparations were underway for the planned Grand Awakening. Not only was there a great underground cave dug around the magnificent hold, but the diamond district was inaugurated, greatly improving the income from precious stones that were being harvested from the bountiful rock. Envoys traveled back and forth constantly, to and from the Suran River and back, exchanging goods, stories, souvenirs and friendship. The Surani humans would in exchange calm down the beholden and distracted them from the expansion preparations. The scouts who bravely traveled the dangerous roads of Far Salahad returned with tragic news from the east. The golden gates of Verkal Gulan have fell. The corruption and hubris of the golden dwarves have led them to disaster and harpies were now infesting the bank of the Dwarovar. Segdir was now alone in the mountain. This fueled the expansionist fervor and despite the protests of the beholden, the expansionists plan were done and polished and the remnant was awakened. The legions of goblins that squatted in the ancient Sek Rod were a terrifying foe, but from the darkness, a new danger has arrived to the gates of Segdir. The orcish warband that announced itself as the Shadow Dreamer clan has scattered the goblins as they approached the Citrine gates. This was great news for King Storkum Lir. Defeating hordes of chaotic beasts was a tough challenge, but in the case of an organized warband, destroying the chieftain should be enough to send them all back into the darkness. Thus, the horns of war were sounded for the first time in decades, and the Shadow Dreamers were quickly pummeled and destroyed. The expansionists began colonizing the caves of East Hollow. After the Orcish warband was purged, colonists arrived in Segrod as well, now that the goblin threat was eliminated. Thanks to the efficiency of the expansionists' plans, the colonies were largely self-funded and the middle Dwarovar infrastructure was reclaimed with great enthusiasm. Magical elite was integrated into the government in 1458 and the mercenary Seg band was employed in the front lines against the monstrous hordes that lurked around the many new colonies. One such colony bordered the tomb of Grandjean Steelbeard, around which the goblin tribe of Greedy Grin was congregating. Greedy Green was driven away and the tomb reclaimed in the name of the ancestors. In 1467, the higher development colonies Splendor Idea paired with three active colonists further fueled Sekdir's expansion efforts. In the capital, digging was continued to the third level in a prosperous hold, observed by dwarven sorcerers from a newly built mage tower. Colonists reached the old gates of Hehodovar, now completely ruined, and Mithril was once again found in the waterlogged cave. As Hehodovar was being rebuilt, priests would add the teachings of Urist the pioneer to their curricula to encourage settlers even further. In 1477, a fortification system was constructed in the capital hold and thus the southern gate was restored to its original glory. The construction of the first manufactory was commenced. The first gemstone mill was built in the diamond district of Segdir. In 1478, bureaucracy of the expanded kingdom was centralized and soon after a huge mushroom cave was discovered in Da's outlet to the joy of the Citrine dwarfs. Scouts would return from the east with news that the harpies of Mulen, who have desecrated the golden halls of Verkal Gulan, were slaughtered by the legions of Jadar. Even though Hero's Vale was captured by the desert elves, the hold itself was not desecrated further. Storkum Lir ordered the expansionists to focus on going east as fast as possible. In 1486, Verkal Gulan was finally liberated from the harpies. The golden hold would henceforth be a faithful vassal to the Citrine throne. For much of history, Segdir was a mighty hold that held the respect of its dwarven peers and its human neighbors. Segdir helped uplift much of the Bulvari humans, even forming the foundations of Azkasur. When the Dwarovar fell, Segdir eventually unified its siblings, Hehodovar, Verkalgulan, Gor Vazumbrok and Gor Ozumbrok under one of its oldest alliance, the Seg Bandal, the Southern Alliance. However, when the Sun Elves came in 1139, the glory of Segdir was cut short by treacherous elven steel and flame. Without Segdir, the Segbandal collapsed into infighting and Segdir itself became a shared hold between the dwarves and the Sun Elven Empire. While many benefits did come from this, 
Such a humiliation cannot be forgiven, and the dwarves carry long grudges. Of course, chronicles are conflicted about the alliance between Segdir and Sariand in the late 15th century, but how else could have the dwarves hoped to defeat the Jadari legions? The enemy of my enemy is my friend, at least for a short while. The dwarves, backed by Sariand and Askasur, descended from the mountains to liberate Hero's Vale. A successful campaign fed a lot of land in Far Salahad to Verkal Gulan. In the west, Hehod of Arhold was restored and granted to the pirate brethren in exchange for their oath of loyalty to the leader of the southern halls. A development program was initiated in Verkal Gulan Hold and Sariand, true to their treacherous ways, have attacked and annexed a large chunk of Askasur. This prompted the Citrin king to step in and protect his loyal friend by diplomatically vassalizing the Surani and declaring Sariand a rival. Despite the anger, King Storkhum Lir's life ended after five decades of success when morning horns sounded in the middle Dwarovar in 1494. His lifeless body was interred in the Hall of Ancestors of the Citrin Hold. The Awakener King was laid to rest and to be remembered for all eternity. His daughter, Queen Broga IV Az Seg, took the throne through lawful succession. She turned out to be an inspiring leader herself, even though her passion for ale made her look like a babbling buffoon at times. Three years after being crowned queen, her realm came to border the skewered Drake clan, who infested the Sek Bandalic hold of Gor Vazumbrog. Her initial war was a success. She reclaimed the western Dwar of Rod and pillaged Gor Vazumbrog, reclaiming many dwarven treasures stolen by the orcs. Her armies repeated the feat in the east as well, clearing out the roads of the poisoned rock goblin tribe. She also attempted to remove the elven threat in Far Salahad, but the desert legions, backed by Irliam's armies of human shields, overran the valiant dwarves and little was seemingly gained from these incursions. But there were enough distractions so that a few Surani core provinces could be liberated from Sariand. A participating force in all of these wars was one of the most notorious and ruthless mercenary group in Karnor, the Seg Band. They first found fame serving as the official bodyguard of the Sun Elven Emperor Jaher, as he grew to distrust the schemes of his ilk. Later, under Jaher's daughter Jexis, they found dwarven notoriety by infiltrating Segdir and allowing it to be conquered and occupied by Jexis and then enforcing her rule within Dwarovar. After her death in 1162, the Seg band, in a surprise to many, peacefully relinquished control in return for amnesty and returned to their mercenary roots. In 1507, Queen Braga has put a series of checks on the Sek Band mercenary group, which was essentially disbanded. Three years later, the colonialism institution was embraced with great enthusiasm. In 1512, the two border holds of Gor Vazumbrog, the first that fell, and Gor Ozumbrog, Segdir's greatest regret, were finally conquered and soon after restored. Five years of mourning were declared in the name of the fallen brethren who died due to the treachery of the Sek Band. Colonists have later confirmed the discovery of a huge mithril deposit in Xazor's Rift, which would further fuel the Citrine armies with high-quality arms and armor. Even though colonial enthusiasm waned significantly after 50 years of tireless work, what followed was an unbroken succession of conquest wars. To the west, the Silver Tusk tribe was attacked for Hul Jorkad and the Jorkad Lake area. Then Gilkalis was vassalized, parts of the Golden Highway were conquered, Verkal Kozenad was humiliated and the Mountain Hugger Goblin tribe was crushed. Yet war was not all that Queen Broga cared about. She would still encourage trade and good relations with whoever wanted to import Serpent's Bloom. This plant only grows in the mountain and its nutritional value is marketed by Segdir's skillful merchants. Dwarven trade barges are a common sight along the Suran River and many native Surani people find employment guarding these barges. Opportunity for employment was also offered to the people of Birzar Tanches. Even if they were ruled by elves, they concerned themselves mostly with bureaucracy and seemed to be more reasonable than other successor states. Gaining favors with them also allowed Broga to request and peacefully receive the lands that rightfully belonged to their vassal Gelkalis. She also secured the diplomatic vassalization of the Blackbeard and the Mithril Arm cartels, thus securing bridgeheads into the middle Dwarovar and into the Serpent's Reach. A new threat from the east came out of the dark tunnels leading into the Tree of Stone. Hordes of barbarian goblins, driven by fear and desperation, fell upon Gor Ozumbrog in 1530, devastating the mighty fortress. 
The goblins must be dealt with, and Broga's generals began crafting plans to enter the Tree of Stone and clean up the goblin threat. This will not be quick nor easy, but it must be done, or else the goblin assaults will not end. In 1541, Queen Braga officially united the Segpandal and paved the way into a golden future. No longer will she rule over a hold and its subjects. From then on, the Segpandal will function as one unit, like in the good old days before Jexis's treachery. This unification of the southern holds marked the time to strike at their dwarven rivals and cripple them for good. The banners of Orazam Azdir, Verkal Kozenad, of Dal Lodhum and Arg Ordstun would have no chance against the united Segbantal and their subjects. The cartels were tasked to oversee the restoration of the conquered holds. In 1552, the inevitable consequence of dwarven greed has finally manifested itself. The Horde curse has arrived to destroy the trade empire of the Citrine dwarves. Stockpiling cash reserves has helped Queen Braga to manage the crisis quite efficiently. The families of the Gan de Ken also eventually bended the knee to the Citrine throne. Rahen was an incredible rich land and trading with the Harimari was an opportunity that could not be missed. With the southern holds united, the Sek band's usefulness waned in the decades to follow. Unable to get over old grudges, the Sek Bandal have decided to forever disband the mercenary company and rely on their own strength instead of the strength of profiteering traitors. Queen Broga, during a magnificent celebration feast, also brought together the leading nobles of the mountain and declared the foundation of the Segam Lavad. Thus, holes would be much better represented politically through a parliamentary system that would allow their regional needs to be met more efficiently. With the mountains west of Gor Ozumbrog under control and the parliament in place, the crown began sponsoring construction projects within the Segbad Dal Corps and a creation of an elite army. Conscription has been abolished and efforts were undertaken to drill an elite voluntary army to perfection for war inside of the tunnels and in the plains of Bulvar. The Hargrun Forge of Hechodovar was lit and the battle golems of the eastern fortress of Gor Vazumbrog were activated. The 17th century marked the entrance of the Sek Bandal into the Tree of Stone. Trading in Rahen and good relations with the freed slaves of Buvauri allowed the elite Sek Bandalic warriors to overcome the roaring cannon batteries of Ovdal Kanzad. After a bloody and explosive war, the Amber Dwarves were subjugated so that their guns could be used for a greater goal, the eradication of the Goblin Plague. Broga's last years were marked by building a solid railway infrastructure and increasing control of the crown through absolutism while settling the political conflicts between the court and the country. She would end her reign in 1633 and would be remembered as Bright Queen Broga the Unifier, fourth of her name as Zeg. She would also be remembered for her insatiable love for ale and the many diplomatic faux pas caused by this passion. Her enemies would try to slander her name by spreading indecent rumors that she would like to spend a bit too much time in Gelkali stables. Nevertheless, nobody in the busy, prosperous and well-lit tunnels of the Serpent Spine would ever fall for such baseless lies. Proga's successor, the golden bright king Magnus Hargrun, being raised in Hechodovar, was a passionate student of law, but also suffered of a sort of naive enthusiasm. He had started his reign with further significant reforms to the army. Mercenaries were strongly discouraged and conscription was completely abolished. Only the best of the best would be chosen from the loyal ranks of the Segbandal to form a very small but incredibly effective fighting force. And what better test for this new army than the mighty command? Finding a justification for war would be easy. The command was a danger for the trade opportunities of the Segbandal in southern Halis. War was declared and the troops marched on. They deftly outmaneuvered the hobgoblins, barely meeting them on the field of battle. And the dwarves instead sieged the enemy forts at a breakneck pace. With the command's fortification completely collapsed, the Citrine warriors declared victory and the Tree of Stone was completely conquered. In 1641, the Segbandic Golden Cartel was officially established after granting many privileges to the traditional merchants guild. The Golden Cartel would require rich investments, but could be set up along the Golden Highway and in Westrahen to greatly increase control of the goods that were changing hands in the regions. A new age of commerce would begin. The March of Gandeken was instrumental to expanding the Golden Cartel in the region. 
the Raheny city-state of Sharajagal was also diplomatically vassalized and employed to set up elephant caravans. The cartel would spread through Rahen, offering great advantages to the controllers of the provinces where it would be installed into, but granting even greater trade benefits to the Segbandal. Segdir is one of the noble holds of the Aul Dwarov, and the namesake of their people, the Citrine Gem, is shown on the Dwarov Kron that rules all dwarves. The Citrine Gem represents the dwarven people's mercantile gifts, to the point that many dwarven merchants keep the gem in their pocket for good luck. The citrine quickly became a very popular gemstone in Halles, beginning the second half of the 17th century. Within the mountains, in 1651, King Magnus has officially instated the syndicates of Ovdal Kanzad and Grozumdir, splitting the western tree of stone between the two. Soon after, Ovdal Az An and Huz Al Krakazol were also installed as Segbandic syndicates. Together, they would be like four spiked maces of a flail ready to swing down upon the foes of the Segbandal, while expanding towards Brasan for full control over the golden highway of the Phoenix Empire, tragedy struck in the serpent's spine. In 1660, an infectious disease appeared in the northwestern regions of the mountain and began to spread quickly through the tunnels, killing millions. The king declared the serpent's rot a national emergency. The Sekbandali coffers financed extensive research in curing the plague, while groups of soldiers were tasked to burn down Ernatvir, the railway hub, and its surrounding caverns to try and slow down the spread of the plague into the heart of the Sekbandal. After long struggles, it was discovered that the plague was not a magical one, and simply a disease which emerged from a strange mushroom cave. Dwarven scholars and medics eventually devised the cure from the disease, and the plague was defeated. The Bright King continued to reclaim Dwarven lands in the Jade Mountain, conquering the tunnels and railway up to the old Jade capital of Gronstunat at first, but from the new liberated hold he could retake the entirety of the Serpent Spine from the control of the Hobgoblins. In parallel, the SGC penetrated the markets of Nadim Raj and the Gulf of Rahen due to Sekbandal's good relations with the free slaves of Puvauri. Trade companies were set up all along the Golden Highway, and Ostkopans were established all the way into the lands of the Xia in a golden century of wheeling and dealing from Brasan to Tianlo. The 18th century was also marked by a major plague of global proportions. This time, it was not a disease of flesh, but one of the mind. Revolution. The command adopted a revolutionary government at once and vowed to spread it across Hal Khan. This could not stand and bright King Magnus declared a crusade to crush it. It would not be easy, it would not be quick, but it had to be done. While wars against revolutionary sentiment raged, trade would not be slowed down. The Sekbandal took direct control of the port of Sardika and the coastline leading up to it. Its former owner, Yarishar, had no chance to contest the change of ownership, while his ally, Buvauri, was distracted in the wars against the revolutionary command. Buvauri realized that the Citrine expansion into Rahen was hurting their own ambitions and eventually decided to cut all diplomatic ties with the dwarves in protest. Even with the loss of a great trading partner, trade company expansion into Halles and the Golden Highway nodes coupled with aggressive founding of trade company infrastructure led to Segdir becoming the richest trade node in the world. Finally, in 1774, the Dwarovar was reborn in the hands of the Segbandal making the Citrine trade empire the most powerful political and commercial force in the world. I wanted to do a video on Sekdir for quite some time, but I do love all the dwarven holds equally. Dwarves are my favorite nations to play in Ambenar, if it was not obvious already. I tend not to make a lot of videos about them, because I just play them in my spare time a lot, and I just lose myself in the gameplay. What makes Sekdir such an interesting candidate is their unique journey. They are obviously the dwarven nation most focused on trade, but otherwise it seems like it has only major disadvantages. The four syndicates from the Tree of Stone are essentially marches that can never be integrated, so they are stunted diplomatically. They are also hit by lack of access late game to the strong duchy's noble privilege. Their personal force limit endgame is 65% smaller than standard, with almost no manpower available due to the fact that only the four Segbandal holds will provide it, no other province will. They are also heavily discouraged to employ mercenaries and have only half the regular government capacity. Their major advantage is the fact that they can expand through trade and trade alone, thanks to the Segbandal Golden Company. 
This is a unique system with its own interface. Through the company and its investments, Segdir can install many permanent province bonuses which grant local or nationwide bonuses to the owners of said provinces, while gaining a lot of local trade power in return, even if they don't own them. Sure, Segdir can conquer and take full advantage of the bonuses, but it feels like this company is best used in a cooperative game. They are very closely tied to Azkasur through both nations' mission trees, but Segdir works very well in a cooperative game with anyone playing in Western Hales or Bulvar. Their custom-built elite army is also pretty awesome, but the lack of manpower is real. The upcoming nerfs to quantity ideas will make their situation even worse, so it will be even tougher to play them in the future. I hope you enjoyed this after-action report, and I can't wait to see you in the next video. I want to offer some special thanks to my Patreons, so thank you Thane Baconomics, thank you Quartermaster Casimir Overell, thank you Iron Guard Darth Mozart, and thank you to all the surveyors Alex, Dan Lambert, Michael VR, and Thor's Main. May your citrine gems bring you prosperity.